So welcome everybody to Food Secure Canada's webinar on Aboriginal food security in Northern Canada. I'm really excited about today's webinar. Um, because, and I think the excitement is shared. We had a, a close to 200 people sign up for today's webinar, which shows the great interest uh, amongst people across Canada in this issue. So um, today we're going to be hearing from Trina Delormier and Chris Fergal, both of whom uh, were on the panel that was assembled by the Canadian Council of Academies in order to respond to a uh, government request for a report on Aboriginal food security in Northern Canada. Um, I will let them get into the details. But first, before we jump into today's topic, um, we will be, uh, is the volume better there, Anne? Thank you for pointing that out. Um, before I jump into today's topic, I, I would do wish to say that this, uh, these webinars, uh, Food Secure Canada hosts a number of webinars. And if you didn't receive information about this directly, I encourage you to sign up to receive our newsletter on the front page of our website. Um, we are a membership-based organization, and much of what we do is thanks to the memberships that um, people across Canada pay to, to support us. So I would encourage you that if you like what you see today, um, then please consider becoming a member of Food Secure Canada. In terms of um, webinar etiquette, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned already a couple times before, I ask that especially if you have joined by telephone, um, that you please, please, please mute your telephone so that we don't hear uh, the many little noises that happen in the background. Um, and for those of you who have joined through your computers, thank you. This is a very low-cost way for us to host these great webinars. Um, and we will be um, opening up for discussion later on. So if you wish to ask a question, I encourage you to call in once the, the, um, the, uh, the presentations have finished to ask your question. So uh, we have with us today Trina Delormier. Uh, at the top of your screen, you see her name there under, um, under her. She's joining us from Hawaii, and it's very early in the morning. Um, so thank you so much, Trina, for making the time to do this. Um, Trina is a Mohawk woman from the Mohawk Tor uh, Territory of Ganawake, which is just outside of uh, Montreal, where we're located at, here at Food Secure Canada. Um, she holds a bachelor and master's degrees in nutrition from McGill and is a professional dietitian. She completed her PhD at the University of Montreal in public health and in health promotion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Trina's research emphasizes community-based research with Aboriginal communities and participatory research approaches. Uh, her research interests include food, nutrition, health, social perspectives on food, um, qualitative methodologies, public health, and health promotion, diabetes and obesity prevention, and Aboriginal conceptions of health. She, uh, since 2012, she's been assistant professor at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. And I know I'm not the only one who is sad to see her leave Canada and the Montreal area. Um, she's also a member of the community advisory board of the 20-year Kanawage School Diabetes Prevention Project, which is a great community university partnership that uh, takes place just outside of Montreal. And maybe we'll have to invite you back sometime, uh, Trina, to talk more about, about that initiative. Chris Frugal um, is an associate professor in the Indigenous Environmental Studies Program at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario. He's cross-appointed to the Department of Indigenous Studies and Environmental Resource Studies. He current, his current research focuses on, on environmental health risks, uh, assessment, management, and communication with Aboriginal communities throughout the Arctic. Outside of his teaching and research, uh, Chris is a co-founder and co-director of the Nasivik Center for Inuit Health and Changing Environments, along with Dr. Eric Diwali. So welcome, both of you. Um, right after uh, Trina and Chris present, we will invite um, Norma, Cassie, and Joseph LeBlanc to, um, to kick off the discussion by uh, proposing some recommendations based on this uh, fantastic study that Trina and Chris worked on. So welcome, Tris, Trina and Chris. Thanks again for being with us. And I hand the mic over to you now. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome, everyone, this afternoon. Thanks for joining in. I know in a lot of uh, parts of the country, it's a beautiful day outside. So <laughs> thanks for staring at your screen a little bit longer. Hopefully, I think with the, with the panel or the group that, um, uh, that Food Secure Canada has put together this afternoon, there should be a, a very interesting discussion, I hope, that, that follows. 
What Trina and myself will give you an overview of, um, and there's just to uh, give you the title slide, um, is an assessment that was released um, just a little while ago, um, I think it was beginning of April, very beginning of April, um, um, that was done or convened by the, the Council of Canadian Academies, which I'll talk a little bit about very briefly as well. Um, so we've heard a little bit about Trina and myself. Um, there's nothing else that I need to add about me. Um, Trina, do you want to add anything else uh, uh, about yourself before we get started? Uh, no, I just want to say welcome to everyone. I think um, Amanda did a great job with the introduction, so we can move along. Great. Okay. Um, and to let people know as well, there's I think on the last page or on the first page of that, on the last page of the slideshow, there's the the link. Um, or people can just search for the Council of Canadian Academies website and, and find the full report downloadable, a couple of videos and, and some of the attachments as well if you're interested in more information um, from the report. And also we're trying to keep our presentation relatively concise so that we have more time for discussion. So we're giving a very level, high, uh, a sort of a high level overview of sort of the highlights of the report as opposed to going down into great detail um, in any one section also, just to let you know. So the Canadian Council of Academies is, is um, an entity that acts outside of government and outside of universities. It's not under the authority of either of those two groups of institutions. And they convene on a regular basis um, panels, multidisciplinary panels, to assess issues of public policy and public interest in response to a request um, from, a, uh, from an entity such as, um, in this case, Health Canada. So the panel that was convened for, to, to look at the issue of the state of our knowledge of food security in Northern Canada um, fits a particular sort of model that the Council of Canadian Academies follows, which is essentially to have representatives from a variety of different disciplines that can talk to different aspects of the issue. So if we look at the picture on the slide there, the chair of the panel, um, someone a lot of people probably know about, Harriet Kuhnlein, um, who's a nutrition a nutritionist, um, professor emeritus from Human Nutrition from McGill and the founder of Cine. Um, the next person going across the front of the line from left to right is uh, Constant McIntosh, uh, a lawyer and director of Dalhousie's uh, Health Law Institute. The next is there's always at least one representative on the Canadian uh, panels as well to give an international perspective. And that was uh, Asbjorn Eide, who's a senior fellow with the Norwegian Center for Human Rights, um, myself, and then Chantal Richmond, who's a professor in geography and First Nation studies at Western University in Ontario. Then on the far right, Laurie Chan, who's a toxicologist um, and works in the area of environmental health and Arctic environmental health from Ottawa. Um, going, moving into the back, Dave Natcher, who's a professor um, at University of Saskatchewan um, and the director of um, the, the Global Institute for Food Security, our senior research, research fellow for the Global Institute. Um, then in the middle at the back is Ian Morrow, uh, who's a filmmaker and assistant professor at University of Winnipeg. Um, Trina, Q Young, um, who many, many people probably know across the north as well. He's now the professor and dean of the School of Public Health at University of Alberta. And then Barry Prentice, um, who was our economist on the group and is uh, a professor in the Department of Supply Chain Management at the University of, Man of Manitoba. People that are not in that uh, picture that were part of the committee as well of the panel was uh, Fikret Burks, um, who works in traditional knowledge and common property resource issues at University of Manitoba. Cecilia Roja, who is the director and associate professor in School of Nutrition at uh, Ryerson. Uh, Murray Humphreys, who's a wildlife biologist um, and is currently the director of CINE at McGill. And then Henry Huntington, who's a, a researcher and currently the Arctic Science Director with the Pew Environmental Group um, out, of, uh, out of Alaska. So the panel process is a little bit different than some of the other assessments many of us were involved in and many of you may pick up and, and read online or, or find um, in paper format in that the process for the panel is very much focused and limited to the criteria um, 
of the charge, responding to the charge um, from a particular sponsor, and in this case, the charge was Health Canada. So they had particular questions in their charge that we were expected to respond to. The next was, like many science assessments, it's very much limited or focused on evidence-written documentation. So we didn't have the opportunity to hold large consultation uh, uh, sessions with individuals, as an example, from a variety of different Indigenous groups or communities that are affected by this issue. And we realized and spoke about sort of that limitation in, in the process as well. But it's the, the format of the, the process the CCA follows. Um, we met uh, five times between uh, over the period of the assessment. And the last one is, and some people are, are sort of pick up the document and are a little bit frustrated with the fact that it goes as far as presenting evidence, but doesn't go as far as presenting solutions or recommendations. That's also a, a constraint on the, the CCA review process. They look at themselves as providing critique and review of the evidence base, not providing policy recommendations. That's up to essentially those that, are then, that will then pick up the document and interpret it, um, the sponsor or, or others. So the charge to the panel was much longer than this, but this is sort of a, a short form. It gives you an idea of the sub-questions that we received from Health Canada that they wanted a review of the evidence about. So the focus was not to report on the state of food insecurity in the North, per se, but rather on the state of knowledge of the various factors, economic, social, cultural, and environmental, that inform our understanding of food security and the health implications of the issue, and particularly for Indigenous populations in the North. As in other council assessments, the report doesn't provide a program review of any particular program, as an example, like Nutrition North Canada, nor of government support programs to assist communities and individuals. And the report, though, does provide a detailed synthesis, really, of the status of what we know about the issue based on our written documentation from science and in this case as well, indigenous knowledge, and identify in that knowledge on the stack of food security across the country. Getting a, a lot Hi, of Chris. background noise from someone's phone. Uh, thank you. If there's somebody who's got quite a bit of background noise, I would ask again that anybody who's calling in to please mute your lines. You can either do that on your on your phone, or you can press star six. Press six. Mute your phone. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Chris. And I'll pass it over now to uh, Trina to present uh, uh, about the report, and then come back to you uh, a little bit later in the presentation um, to talk a little bit about uh, uh, sort of some of our key conclusions and key findings and, and limitations. So over to you, Trina. Okay. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> so what you're looking at here is um, a conceptual framework that the panel thought would be useful for organizing the many factors we realize are involved with um, understanding the issue of food security and food sovereignty for populations in northern Canada. And what I want to point out for um, the conceptual framework is the fact that at the center we have northern Aboriginal peoples, and this was a key um, factor that we felt was important to understand when we're talking about this issue of people at the center of this experience. And we also wanted to show that when we're talking about food security or food and food sovereignty, that this is emergent. It's emerging from a complex interplay of factors. Um, and we can also understand it as emerging from these complex sets of relationships that are depicted in the very um, busy, but we felt it had to be um, a conceptual framework that captured the many factors that are involved. And there is a video, if you go to the, um, the website where you find the report, that explains the, um, how this conceptual framework illustrates security and how we understood it. And then you'll see in the report, each of the chapters addresses a, an area of relationships that we see in this um, conceptual framework. And when we're talking about the North, because um, most of us, I'm sure you've realized, have uh, that the geographic scope of the report is the North. And how we understood this and operated in this definition was looking at um, two, two sorts of combined definitions of the North. The first being um, this brown area over here, 
or green. I don't know how it appears on your screen, but this is a geographic area, which is the, the north, the area north of the most southernmost limit of discontinuous permafrost. But we also had another area defined by um, our sponsor, which was the region served by Nutrition North Canada, which is the Slough area, and was the area covering um, communities and the time frame from 2011 to 2012, which was when our panel was composed to address this issue. So these two areas combined um, define the area of north that we were operating on of understanding this issue of food security. And of course, not just talking about a geographic area or an area covered by a program, we are talking about populations of, of people who um, live in these areas and have been living in these areas for um, generations. So what we see here is um, kind of an overview of Aboriginal populations in Northern Canada from 2011. So we see that there's definitely um, diversity, um, even though primarily people might think that in the North we have Inuit populations. If we look at the distribution of populations in the north, we have First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Um, and in the red boxes, you see the primary populations by location here. Um, and I also want to note that we, even though we group Aboriginal populations in Canada constitutionally with three groups, um, or into three groups, for Na First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, our panel did recognize that within each of these groupings, there is multiple, uh, there's so much diversity in terms of culture, in terms of histor history, historical experience, political context, and um, we wanted to note as well that we're aware of these, <clears throat> of this diversity. And as Chris alluded to a little bit earlier, um, the panel found it challenging um, because of the, the approach that was taken. Um, it was a challenge for us to assess the considerable evidence, there's just a wealth of evidence from the scientific research and from documents, but we also recognize the evidence from traditional knowledge and from a lot of the gray literature um, that's around addressing this issue. And that represents a lot of good work done at the community level and by communities, all of which we felt was important to inform the subject. However, um, as Chris mentioned, the panel or the, the council methodology does not conduct consultations, which was difficult for most of us who work with Indigenous communities because we realize there's that process which is so useful in informing um, and learning about issues that we're concerned about. And the other thing to note is that this sort of review, um, as comprehensive as it is of all this knowledge, we realized had never been undertaken before. So it was quite um, a challenge and I think that with um, our panel and the council working together we did um, put a best effort forward to ensure that we included um, the best information that was available. We did um, address, we did seek, um, the panel had advised the council to seek information from organizations that represent different indigenous populations. So an effort was made as much as possible to seek um, the types of literature that might not be as easily accessed, assessed from um, or I don't know, a, a regular review of, of the literature. So efforts were made to include different sorts of knowledges as well. <clears throat> and just by way of terminology, um, the panel used the terminology for food security and food insecurity defined by the FAO Committee on World Food Security that was developed in 2012 that included nutrition. So food and nutrition security exists when all people at all times have physical and social economic access to food which is safe and consumed in sufficient quantity and quality to meet their dietary needs and food preferences and is supported by an environment of adequate sanitation, health services and care allowing for a healthy and active life. So we used a very um, broad and current definition of food security and uh, food insecurity conversely was understood as an outcome of inadequate or uncertain access to an acceptable amount and quality of healthy food.
this slide just shows um, the structure of the report. <clears throat> And you'll see it is a very um, long report, many chapters, and they re each chapter, um, we starting from the chapter four until chapter nine, I believe, the um, the conceptual framework area that's covered is shown there. So I thought that was a very useful way of outlining the report. <clears throat> so getting into a bit of the information the data that's in the report. Um, this first table is coming from Chapter 3, and it's showing prevalence rates of household food insecurity from 2005 to 2011. And it's looking at total food insecurity, so it's putting together um, marginal, moderate, and severe, severe food insecurity in provinces and territories over this time period. Um, we have two statistics in red over here, which were taken from a report that wasn't included because it um, came out later than um, our, our process could incorporate it. And this was from the household food security study report that's um, put out by Proof the, um, and Valerie Tarasuk's group. And basically, it's showing that um, you know in two t 2012, for the Northwest Territories, and Nunavut, we have statistics um, updated that are showing an increase in food insecurity. And overall, what this is showing that food security rate, insecurity rates have been the same or increasing um, for a number for a number of provinces. So in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Quebec, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, they've had the highest rates ever recorded in those provinces in 2011. However, in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, there was a different story there where we noticed that, uh, well, where it was noted that food insecurity has been declining since 2005 to the point that the province demonstrated actually the lowest prevalence in 2011. So we see that, you know, when we look by province and by year, there's different, um, different trends happening. And in terms of the assessment method, methods, um, the measurement methods used to assess food security that have been used to date, they have been really valuable. Of course, we've seen the information that is able to be uh, summarized from our current methods. But the panel definitely realized that um, there are some limits and the ability to respond to the, the specific complexity and context um, for Aboriginal peoples in the North and food security and trying to tap into those dimensions, um, we realized there was a challenge there and there's limits. So what that means is that um, this restricts, in a sense, the way that we measure food security in this area, it restricts the extent to which researchers can understand the links among um, things like traditional food systems, which are not usually assessed in our typical household food security assessment methods, um, holistic health, so understanding health in a way that addresses cultural health, um, mental health, health not just at an individual level, but at community levels. So we realize that um, there are limitations in the way we're assessing food security. And this also has implications for um, further work that needs to be um, done in terms of assessing food security more accurately in the North, and also to develop the kinds of systems that would help us monitor food insecurity so that policies and programs could be better designed to address um, the specific experience of food security in the North. <clears throat> so in this slide, what we're looking at is um, we're looking at different areas um, regions of Inuit um, populations and the households. So we have the Nunavut, um, Inu Inuvialuit area, Nunatiavut, and then we have this compared to all Canadian households. Um, and what we're looking at is different levels of food insecurity, gray being the severe food insecurity and moderate food insecurity shown in gold, and then we have the food secure households. So we see that when we're looking 
at different regions. Um, and these have these were studies that have been, you know, uh, done specifically to assess food insecurity in these populations. That the situation is quite serious um, compared to a general Canadian household comparison. And then looking at um, populations um, that are vulnerable to food insecurity, I'm just a little bit distracted because there's a bit of noise outside. I hope that's not interfering with um, my presentation. So what we what the report um, is presenting uh, in terms of vulnerable populations is that something most of us who are working in this field already know is that women and children are particularly vulnerable to food insecurity. And what, what this graph shows, um, or what this figure is showing, is that, and I believe there was a slide before, but there was an animation. So um, you, if you look in the report, there's another figure that shows that whether you look at um, Inuit, Households, First Nations, Métis, or and non-Aboriginal households, women are more vulnerable. Will be more likely to be living in food insecure households. And if we look particularly, as this slide is showing, at children, we see that um, for Inuit preschoolers, 70% uh, of Inuit preschoolers are living in food insecure households, which is really um, astounding. And of of preschoolers. Um, the Inuit, of Inuit preschoolers that are moderately food insecure, so who fall within that category um, assessed as moderately food insecure, 31% um, of the Inuit children are. And if we look more closely at severely food insecure Inuit preschoolers um, and that experience, the 25% who are living with that experience, 90% of them are going hungry. Um, they're modifying their behaviors, they're skipping meals to deal with um, that situation, and 60% had gone a day without eating. And I would refer you to um, the report to get more details on the source of the information and the surveys and the specifics of the details, um, because in this short presentation, we don't have much time to go into the details of it, but needless to say, it's very clear that um, we need to be particularly concerned about children um, and Inuit children because of the severity of food insecurity that they're experiencing. And of course, um, the idea of we are aware of the impact of food insecurity, that this has um, significant implications for health and wellness. It's not just uh, an experience of dealing with accessibility or availability of food, it has real implications for health. And when we talk about health, we're talking about health very broadly understood. So mental health, physical health. And um, we know that food insecurity is linked to negative physical and mental health outcomes. So these include poor dietary quality, undernutrition or undernourishment, obesity, chronic diseases such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease and poor educational outcomes, as well as family stress. So we see the impacts are very broad and wide-reaching. <clears throat> and we also understand that being in good health and um, having um, a wellness um, experience can enable food security. So there's also that other aspect that when people are well, they're in better shape to um, be food secure, whereas poor health can be a barrier. And finally, um, the report talks a lot about contextualizing the experience of food insecurity and why this is happening and how it's happening currently. We have, the panel realizes that there um, are transformations happening in diets, but these are reflections of transformations that are happening in northern Aboriginal communities. And um, these are complex transformations that are coming about, um, changes in the economic and political environments. And we can see these if we study food and changes in diets and food use. These are reflecting, the changes in food are reflecting these changes in the north. And in many cases are um, the context in which food insecurity is, is being shaped. 
So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Chris, who will talk more about um, environmental changes and other aspects of food security. And Chris, just before you, you start again, uh, this is Amanda here. I, I'd just like to point out that it is 1.30, and technically your presentation um, should be done. So I'll give you maybe three minutes to, sure. to wrap yeah. up there, Chris. Yeah, so what I'll do is, um, and I encourage people to go to the, the website to get more information about these sections, but I'll just give you some sort of highlights to, uh, to, to wrap up and finish off from where Trina has left it. The next is we do have a section in the report about the impact and what we currently understand about environmental change and what it is meaning for food security and insecurity um, in uh, Indigenous communities across the North, and particularly the issues related to uh, climate change and wildlife availability and also accessibility. The other is the report goes into um, some detail around some of the barriers and facilitators for accessing food and hindrances for getting food, physical, cultural, economic, as well as environmental, and uh, those are quite uh, uh, diverse also. Um, and I would say that, again, related to the process of the report, again, we're reporting on what's, what's available in the written literature predominantly, and of course people on the ground know about probably even more than that in terms of the realities that are being faced in, in northern communities. The next is the fact that the report appreciates the fact that there really is no one single experience related to food insecurity. Even we have regional statistics, but even within regions, there's great diversity from community to community. And currently, there's not a lot of data that represents that, the diversity between communities and the realities between communities, where, as an example, one community may have greater and, and more significant access to wildlife resources and be able to support their household food security status in that way, whereas a community 300 kilometers in another direction may have access to a very different variety of species or a, a, a more limited or diverse uh, um, a range of species. Also, the nature of sort of local stores and control over local stores, the number of stores and what those stores are delivering as well. So there is appreciation for that. There is a, a, a strong body of literature um, around this issue. We recognize that, but we also recognize, and it's reported, or we've highlighted in the report, that there are still a number of fairly important knowledge gaps that persist in the written forms and, and, and what we're able to understand from written reports currently uh, about the issue. Um, all, not all of these are identified, obviously, uh, in the report. As many as we were able to identify from the literature are there. Um, and they give some direction as an example to key things we need to learn about in order to perhaps design and develop uh, focused and what we might hope may be the best successful interventions um, or pilot programs to address these issues in different locations in the future. Um, some of those knowledge gaps exist around enablers and barriers, around food security as a determinant of health, um, and then uh, issues with regards to um, both store-bought and country food. And so moving right along here um, to try and wrap up so we have time for discussion. Um, we understand right now that we have the tools and the knowledge really required, I think, to, to do a lot about the issue. Um, through a body of academic research and traditional knowledge networks, there are some barriers in the way. Um, but really one of the things that the report highlights is there are lots of very valuable activities going on on the ground, but relatively, at least in the written documentation, relatively little evaluation being shared about what's working and what's not working. And that's a key gap we think that needs to be addressed in the future so that other communities, other regions and jurisdictions might be able to learn from another and, and apply perhaps what might be most appropriate for their circumstance or for their context. In reviewing the report, it's just a reminder that we as authors of the report as well recognize there were some challenges, but also some lessons learned in the process. Um, we've talked about some of those um, already related to the directed nature of the scope of the assessment. It's not the be all and end all about everything we know about food insecurity and security in the North. Access to existing data, really the report's only as good as the data uh, uh, that was available. Um, and also aspects or limitations on the process that's typically done for this form of an assessment. 
um, the fact that we are very much relying on uh, uh, written documentation. We started to use, and I'll just highlight one of these findings here, we, we really started to recognize, and probably what everybody on the phone probably knows and is using the language of, but even as very sort of conservative and evidence-focused academics, I'll put it that way, we were very compelled by even what's already in the written literature of the fact that this is not just a serious problem. We started to use the terminology or the word crisis um, in our writing and, and in our reporting of that. Um, so we, we sort of agree, as an example, with the, the UN Special Envoy terminology um, and approach to the issue and say that the evidence really is there to support the, the, the need for action and the need for urgent action now um, uh, as opposed to exclusively or solely more research. However, with that, there are some things that we likely need to learn more about in order to best focus action uh, that is perhaps most or, or has the greatest chance of being most successful. So with that, I'll wrap up, direct you to the, the, the website if you'd like to download the report. As Trina has mentioned, there's um, a video about the, the model that was developed and the way we structured the report as well. Um, and uh, it provides all of the details that a brief overview like this can provide. So thank you very much for your attention and time today. Anything else, Trina? Oh, we can't hear you, Trina. Oh, perhaps you're muted, Trina. Sorry, I just said that was um, that was great. Thanks, Chris. Great. Thank you. Okay, so thank you both of you for uh, a great overview of what is a very elaborate report. I believe it's close to 300 pages. So I would encourage you, who those of you who are, um, um, you know, anxious for details, to have a look at that report. Um, to to carry us into the the place that uh, Chris highlighted is not in this report, uh, to carry us into the recommendations. Uh, how, what do we do about this crisis? Uh, I've asked two members of our, the Northern and Remote Food Network, Joseph LeBlanc and Norma Cassie, to, um, to spell out for us some of the recommendations that they uh, have been pursuing in their own work uh, and uh, through their work with, with the Northern Network. So Norma, we still can't see you. So again, you just need to press um, start your webcam at the top of your screen. Um, and perhaps since um, I'll just introduce you while you're doing that. So Norma Cassie was raised and educated in Old Crow, the Yukon. She is a Vuntut Gwich'in people of the lakes and a member of the Wolf Clan. She co-founded the Arctic Institute of Community-Based Research up in the Yukon and worked as co-director until she was elected chief of Vuntut Gwinich, Gwich in, in November 2010. As co-director of AIBCR, I, Norma was um, engaged in community-based health research, particularly with Yukon First Nations. And Joseph LeBlanc um, has been engaged in Indigenous food sovereignty and security issues for the past eight years. In this time, he's worked with First Nations communities throughout Northern Ontario on various food systems issues, including forest food contamination, community and forest gardening, non-timber forest product development and marketing. He's currently a PhD candidate in forest sciences at Lakehead University and is conducting community-based research pertaining to Aboriginal perspectives of food security and nat uh, natural resource management. So thank you both of you for being with us. Norma, we still can't see you, so if you could press start on your webcam and, um, and then lots of starts on the buttons. And in the meantime, I'll get Joseph um, uh, starting if for three to three to five minutes, Joseph, if you could uh, give us your recommendations, two to three recommendations on how to address this crisis in the north. Sure. Am I unmuted now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. All right. Excellent. So I want to start by thanking uh, the Council of Canadian Academies and the researchers that did share the research. Um, I think uh, a lot of us in the movement here have been. Uh, quite interested to hear what comes out of it. I know we did express um, concern over the lack of consultation, and I, I think your presentation brought some clarity to uh, why that w process was followed, and I thank you for that. Um, as far as moving towards uh, recommendations and the, con and the conversation that we need to be having uh, moving forward, and you know, hopefully today, and, and we can carry forward with the Northern Network, is um, 
starting to look at those community solutions that are there and, and you acknowledge you know that those are uh, often not reported on in the same way and and I think that's a, a function of you know their their funding sources and where these things come from and the energy that drives them whereas you know often community based or grassroots solutions are, are exactly that and they come from communities and they often don't have that uh, reporting requirement or, or that analysis that's needed that would come through an academic institution or, or a granting agency. So it is something I think that we have to find a way to engage uh, food actionists and community leaders in uh, starting to report what it is they're doing. but you know, mainly with the focus of connecting other communities with them. Um, that's, I think, where we've seen the most success is starting to look at how um, the local grassroots solutions that are that are uh, present <coughs> be, start to become shared with other uh, champions and other communities and move forward those ideas. Um, so this type of, you know, trade in tradition and, and sharing knowledge, I think, is an important role that um, outside agencies can play with. But certainly anybody on the uh, on the call or, or in these communities can uh, start to, to build those bridges themselves. And, and we hope that, you know, Food Scare Canada can play a role in doing that. And, and conversations like this are one example of that. Um, so as far as uh, those solutions, though, that do come and... and uh, uh, it's unfortunate because, you know, in some cases when we see um, these ideas come forward that are, you know, set to solve the food security crisis, um, they often involve the imposition of practices that, that are unnatural or, or non-Indigenous to those places. And so, you know, where we've seen um, gardening programs fall short is, is, you know, when the support is gone to build that garden from, you know, researchers, academic institutions, whether people actually participate and pick that practice up. And um, some of the really exciting stuff that came out of some work in Manitoba is looking at traditional um, harvesting activities and how those can be uh, really long-lasting solutions. But one of the critical elements there is that those are uh, reflections of how people have always fed themselves and, and ourselves on the land base and use, utilizing indigenous resources, uh, meaning you know stuff that exists around us, um, to rebuild indigenous food systems which were built using those food sources and, and the practices that are there. Um, so you know, I'm conscious of time here, but you know, just really want to leave it at with the with the participants and the people listening that you know that. The point of these research uh, projects are to educate, and it's up to us to, you know, ensure that it doesn't collect dust on a shelf somewhere, and that what's in there is something that we utilize and move forward with, and that we find a way uh, to match the outside support with community visions, and and finding a way for um, local communities to set that vision and those targets for addressing food insecurity in their communities, and um, that the external organizations and funders uh, find a way to fit within that. So um, I look forward to the discussion later and certainly to Norma's response as well. Thanks so much, Joseph. Thanks. And I'll hand it over to you, Norma. Okay, um, thank you. Um, it's uh, we're all sitting around the table here and um, just looking at the shocking statistics that's been just uh, presented here, and uh, it's it's quite alarming, and it really sets us back here to I guess to look at um, how serious this is, and that we and how cohesively and collaborate in collaboration that we need to work together in this country to begin to um, bring this awareness to this country in, like Joseph said, to the leaders and, and governments that be. I mean, this is, this is uncalled for in Canada and, um, and how we need to really work at this. I, I know, and first of all, I also want to thank the Council of Canadian Academies for, for doing such an incredible research. Um, and uh, with really credible researchers there, people that we, we have worked with, with over the years. And uh, I commend you for, for your work, and thank you for that. Um, we here in the Yukon are, are struggling to try and combat um, this whole food insecurity issue here. When you go right to and look at what's going on in the Yukon and assessing what's happening, there's a lot of depletion of uh, traditional food sources that's also very alarming to us and to adapt is quite 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 an issue 
Um, we have we started a food security strategy here in the Yukon, and it was going very well with five communities. And all of a sudden, it, the the funding was cut. So now we're where the communities are left left hanging. I think one of the most important things here is that um, we have got to look at um, exactly the the answers that the communities have for themselves and how they would like to see how they would like to move forward in becoming more food secure in their future. When we um, discuss the, these issues with the with the communities, um, um, immediately what comes to us is that. Our people had lived through this many thousands, uh, thousands of years ago, or I mean hundreds of years ago, and where there was only traditional foods available, and there was an abundance of traditional foods available in, in, in over seasons and sometimes in areas there was none, and how the people came together and traveled long ways to assist each other in being more food secure. And immediately our elders revert back to that as a, as a, as a strategy that we need to look at as an as ancient method. And that is a challenge because to do, to become more food secure, relationships have to be built, people have to be on par, people have to know that we have to care for each other, and fundamentally we need to change our priorities and in, in, in focus on children eating first. And, um, and how we need to really focus on, on, on the children. Uh, because when we were children, we got the, the traditional foods, we got the good, we got the good fish, we got, we got everything. We got all the traditional foods and we ate first. And the elders would say, well, I ate all that in my lifetime, give it to the children. So we're coming to a place right now where we, we are faced with that, where there's very little food uh, traditional food availability now um, all across the country. And, um, and the only people that can deal with this are the people at the grassroots level in assistance with people like yourselves and, and across this country who are very concerned about this. And that we start moving forward um, in doing this. Uh, the um, I'm just not sure at this point, uh, like looking at the politics of this, if there has been any response from the government of Canada. There's still there's still um, a need for a Canadian food policy, um, and I'm hoping that you know at some point there there needs to be some kind of effort to get that to happen. Um, other than you know, what's happening here in the Yukon, we need to, again, we've signed research agreements with, with communities, and right in the midst of that, the funding was cut. Um, the funding that was coming from uh, um, the Canadian Growing Forward to pro project. Um, and, the, and the communities really want this. They want to plan forward, and they want to plan as a community, as a nation, like uh, the Tlingits want to plan in their communities and also expand to their nation because that's how, um, and also work with the people, the non-Aboriginal people living in their territory and build those partnerships and begin to plan forward and be, and come up with a food security plan for their future. And uh, we're going to continue to work on that here in the Yukon. And um, right now, the issue, of course, is funding. Um, I think each territory, each community needs to, like a rock drop, and like a dropping a rock in the in the in the water, and and start working from that center and work out and be, and start collaborating with others with us in the smaller communities and working out that way. Um, Anyways, I, I, I'll just leave it at that, and uh, thank you very much again for for um, for this. Uh, it's uh, an eye-opener. It's not something that we didn't know, however, when you see it like this, 
it, it's very, very serious. And I think uh, we, we, we're going to need a real collaborative effort in this country to deal with, the, with uh, food insecurity. Thanks so much, Norma. That's, uh, that's great. Um, and I think the, the emphasis on, um, on community-based approaches is, is so crucial and vital. Um, I, we have on the line, uh, Sarah, I hope you've called in. Or Sarah, are you there? You want to unmute your line just while I introduce you quickly? Uh, maybe in just one or two minutes, Sarah um, coordinates, Sarah, sorry, Sarah Strathen coordinates the uh, Coalition on Food Security up in Nunavut who have come up with a food strategy um, in collaboration with government, uh, community partners, um, and I believe businesses as well. And I'd love to hear just very quickly uh, maybe one or two of the top uh, um, things that you are pursuing in Nunavut to improve food security there. Sarah, are you with us? Yeah, can you hear me? I can, thanks. Wonderful. Okay, so my name is Sarah Statham, and I'm the Territorial Food Security Coordinator with the Government of Nunavut Department of Health. But I work really closely with the entire uh, Nunavut Food Security Coalition, which has uh, 30 members. Um, as, as Amanda said, it's quite a diverse group. Um, so Amanda asked if I would quickly speak about the work that we're doing to try to improve security in Nunavut. Um, and I guess our biggest accomplishment now is the recent release of the Nunavut Food Security Strategy which took place on May 5th, which was strategically chosen because it's the first day of National Hunger Awareness Week. Um, so without getting into too much detail, I guess just broadly, um, you know, food, food insecurity is you know, viewed as a determinant of health, but we recognize that there are many facets uh, to this issue. And so we took a holistic approach to trying to address the issue, and so we outlined six themes within the strategy, each with its own mission, rationale, goals, and actions in our action plan. Um, and those are, the first three are kind of the what. So we, have, we do have country food, which is recognized as an important cultural source of food. Uh, we have store-bought food, uh, and that's, you know, in recognition that a lot of uh, Northerners also rely heavily on grocery stores, so that's a big component. And then we have local food production. And then the next three are sort of the how, so how are we going to you know, try to enhance those. And so the first is through life skills development, uh, the second is through programs and community initiative, and then through policy and legislation. Um, so those are our six themes. And for the strategy and action plan, we really tried to focus on what we call made in Nunavut solutions. So we want to ensure that we're doing the best with what we have um, in the territory. And rather than, you know, kind of trying to be critical <laughs> of the, of the you know, federal government um, for support, you know, we're trying to just make sure that we're doing all that we can. And it should be noted that um, our human and financial resources have been made available through Health Canada, which is great. So. Uh, we do have some several large projects on the go, but I don't have time to get into those. But if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to get in touch with me. I'll put up my email address on the chat there, as well as a link to the Coalition's website and our food security strategy. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. That's just a little, a little taste. And again, it's something that I would love to, uh, to potentially have a webinar about in the future, because I, I know there's lots of great stuff there. So um, we have a, a few minutes to address some of the questions that there's been lots of great chat in the boxes. Um, and I'm sure the presenters have been uh, looking at those. I see a lot of interest in um, these community-based solutions and particularly around uh, traditional foods. Um, I just, maybe we could do like a one last round, Chris, Trina, and Norma, and Joseph, and just address some of the questions that you've been seeing going by in the chat box. Um, and any particular uh, you know, Norma and Joseph, I'd love to hear um, your recommendations around Nutrition North, which is the one uh, federal government policy uh, that does um, address food insecurity, well, attempts to address food insecurity in, in northern Canada. So, Chris, maybe a last comment from you? Sure, yeah. I think one of the things that we recognize in the report, and, and I see a lot of chat about in I've already started to check out some of the web links that people are sharing about their programs they're running, is exactly that. There's a lot being learned in a lot of different locations. 
um, and, and a, a, a huge wealth of knowledge that exists among people in communities that are doing things that are most appropriate for their community in the most appropriate way. And I think we, we need to uh, collectively put sort of more emphasis on finding a way best to share that information and learn from one another because there's a lot of great lessons being learned that may be great sort of uh, uh, of great value for other communities to start their initiatives and, and not having to start from scratch. How do we even deal with the issue that we've got in our community? So I think that's one of the things that I'm seeing in the website in, in sharing a lot of these uh, these links, um, and that we definitely recognize in the uh, uh, in the report. There's a lot more out there than simply sort of the academic knowledge, and we need to be able we need to figure a way of harnessing and, and and sharing that across the north. Trina, over to you. I agree um, with. Yeah, okay, I'm going to agree with, with Chris on that. <clears throat> we definitely need to find a way for um, to showcase, to share information, to find ways to evaluate these many, many initiatives that we are aware of are um, happening in communities. So I, I, and I know that in a previous um, webinar, the focus was on evaluating food security strategies. I've participated in that one. So yeah, if we could think of a way, um, I don't know how to, what the best way would be for communities to be able to access those forms but share that knowledge that's being created in communities. Um, just two points that were brought up in the chat box. One was, um, there's a few questions, was climate change addressed? And yes, in the report we do address climate change um, definitely in the chapter seven, that's looking at the nutrition transition, which looks at diff, you know, not only climate change but economic change and political changes that, um, in which food systems are changing. And also the chapter on environmental change, you'll find information that's looking, uh, addressing how climate change is affecting food systems. And Norma's also um, talked a bit about that. And the other notion was um, we had mentioned food sovereignty but didn't really get into um, a discussion on food sovereignty, but food sovereignty was a concept that the panel felt we needed to include in that conceptual model because food security um, and the way it's defined we found is definitely useful, but food sovereignty allows us to look at um, the control that communities have over their food systems and what, you know, understanding that that's important, that's an important context and way of understanding food security in the North. So I just wanted to um, address those two points. Thank you. Thanks very much, Trina. Norma, last last comment? I think you're muted, Norma. I'm muted here. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Um, I think... Uh, I guess, firstly, I just want to acknowledge that um, um, in the territory here in the Yukon Territory, there, the Health Canada's Climate Change and Adaptation Program has done very well in um, uh, uh, promoting some of the, the proposals that have been coming forth across the country um, in, in assisting some of the communities to do food security strategies. And we've completed two. Uh, we're, we've completed one for a small northern community in Old Crow. We've also completed another one, or we're in, in the process of completing another one um, that's also funded through Health Canada. And I just want to say thank you to Health Canada for that. Um, I, I guess, uh, again, I just can't say enough that um, th this is very, very important as uh, climate change comes our way in the Arctic, the permafrost is melting away underneath us. Um, our traditional food sources are declining at a very fast rate. And, um, and right now the communities in the, along the Yukon River system cannot harvest salmon this year. And that has a huge impact on, in every way possible and uh, so there's certainly ways that we're going to have to um, uh, work together and figure this out. And uh, um, and it's good that people, there's so many people here online 
that you know hearing all this that we can you know people are concerned out there and food secure Canada as well that uh, a good point to start from and uh, and I'm glad that uh, I'm, I guess I just want to say thank you to everyone wonderful thanks very much Norma to you for taking the time to present today Joseph we can't see him but he's on the phone Joseph you want to give a last call? comment and then we're going to wrap up and move on to our northern network meeting sure so yeah i think um in general you know i think that the other presenters have hit it right on this is really important stuff it's very important that it's been elevated to this level uh and that we do have to ensure that we match uh community visions with with those of um, funders and other people but uh, you know just get directly to the question about nutrition north canada and you know this is one of the uh one of those programs that does sort of impose a uh an external solution to these to these issues and i thought your first map was quite interesting in in showing those areas that you know nutrition north was included in because there are 15 remote communities here in ontario that are not included in that um and there is no data being collected uh, through that program on the need for something like that in those communities. Um, so I think you know that there's there's something there in Nutrition North. Those communities that do have it can make uh, good use of it, and uh, you know if they do have connections to suppliers that are that are interested in creating access to food and not um, on profiting from people. But in general, I think that there's. A, there's a lot of work to be done in Nutrition North and in a lot of these external solutions that are coming to the community. So uh, it's time, I think, to, to you know have those conversations and. Uh Uh, where we're at, we did have uh, about 110 people watching, so I think that's a great sign, and it's something that uh, we invite everybody who's interested to continue on this uh, journey and discussion with us in, in trying to solve these problems. So, uh, thanks again for having me, and uh, and uh, thanks to the other presenters. Well, uh, thanks just, all around. It's uh, it's been wonderful to have all of you um, with such a breadth and depth of experience uh, sharing uh, your perspectives with us here today. Uh, very quickly, because we do have a Northern and Remote Food Network meeting that's starting right now on a different teleconference line, um, but I just encourage all of you to sign up for our newsletter. That's the Food Secure Canada newsletter that you can sign up for on the front homepage, foodsecurecanada.org. Um, and if you'd like to receive uh, information about future activities of the Northern and Refo Remote Food Network, please go to Communities, and then you'll find under there the Northern and Remote Food uh, Network. And through there, you can sign up to become a, a participant in that network. So, and as I mentioned at the opening, we are a membership-based organization and um, rely heavily on, on uh, the membership fees of members across Canada to do this kind of great work. And I'd encourage you to, to, be, to join us and become a member. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our presenters and discussions today. It was a pleasure. And uh, please stay tuned for future conversations such as this in the future. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Amanda. Bye. Thanks. Bye.